All right, perfect. So um, you have no issues hearing me, right? Before I actually go get this started? You sound great to me. Okay, perfect. All right, so what's going on, everybody? My name is Andres Velasquez, a real estate agent with Signature Realty. I've actually got a really, really special guest, someone I've known for a long time now. Uh, actually, someone we worked together uh, for a couple of years going into the business. And I, hopefully he'll elaborate on that in just a little bit. But, you know, let me not delay this any further. This is Gabriel Garces of Crown Mortgage Lender and Real Estate Agent. But we're going to focus on the first part a little bit more today. What's up, Gabe? Uh, pretty good, man. It's great seeing you. Great to be here. Excited. Oh, my God. Listen, dude, I, I would not have imagined, you know, fast forward, because I started real estate in like 2016, I think. And fast forward, you know, to see how far we both have come since then, it's uh, pretty remarkable. Oh, man. Dude, I remember you were asking me like the most basic questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to know something? You want to know something, too? That's so funny is, um, you know, we're going to digress a little bit, guys, here. But um, when I first started real estate, you know, we shared the same office. And then you were like, you looked at me over, you looked at me and you had this like big packet of manila folder leads. And you're like, I didn't call any of these leads, call them, see if they want to buy. I was like, okay. And then I actually closed one of them and you're like, oh shit. And like, I, <laughs> I feel like yeah. you had zero hope that there was anything in there. And I was just like, okay, well, listen. For my yeah, first that was called like, that was my, my dead lead pile. And I was like, ah, maybe you'll make, you'll brought to late, uh, life one of them. Like yeah. one of them. And you did. So yeah, and that's yeah, when right. I knew you were going to do good in this bit. I was like, ah, oh, this guy's going to be good. <laughs> all right so so listen i let, let's let's get started a little bit i want to give people a little bit of background as far as you are i know i gave a little brief introduction uh but maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know what company you work for now um you know what uh what you what sort of led you to come to this point in your life right like this career choice because obviously you and i sort of have the same background as far as you know, school and what we studied. And, and obviously that's not anywhere near close to what we're doing. Sure. Yeah. Good question. So, so we, obviously everybody knows now that we used to work together. I've been a real estate agent. I think I started one year before Andres. Um, and, you know, I've been a pretty, pretty decent producing real estate agent. And what got me into mortgages was one day um, someone told me that you could actually do both. So when I got into the business, I was told that you couldn't have both licenses or you couldn't practice both. And there's actually some truth to that and there's not. So just to have all, all legal stuff out of the way, FHA does say you cannot be the loan officer and the agent on the same transaction. Conventional mortgage doesn't state anything. So pretty much when I saw the opportunity to do both, my, my head was just, you know, dollar signs, right? I was just thinking, hey, I already got the client, you know, I'm just gonna do the mortgage as well and make, you know, double the money. Who better and to trust than yourself, I guess, right? A hundred percent. I mean, that's another thing too. I mean, you know, what's kind of frustrating is, you know, when you depend on a loan officer, you know, you got to get updates from him. So when I was my own loan officer, just like, all right, well, I know exactly what's going on. So that, it was great. So I did enjoy uh, doing both for, for, you know, one or two years. Uh, but now I'm really enjoying more the lending side. So I'm doing less real estate, doing more mortgages. Um, you know, Anja is one of the uh, agents I work with primarily. Um, and that, that's pretty much what got me into it. Well, that, that, that's great. And, and so as far as uh, what, what was it that you studied? Because I feel like that's the other thing is that a lot of people watching this are actually probably not, maybe not looking to purchase right now. At some point, obviously, home ownership is, I think, the primary goal for all, a lot of us. Uh, but some of us are actually thinking about getting into the business of real estate and, and realizing that, you know, you might not take this, you know, the, the path that kind of gets you there. Right. So like you and I both have what, like engineering backgrounds, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, I always well, tell people, I don't know how the hell I did that. <laughs> oh man. It, it, so it, it, it's, it's a really, really bizarre, but I guess um, you work now with crown mortgage, right? That's the company that yes. the lender that you work with, where are they based out of? So we're, uh, we're the Rutherford, Rutherford Van, branch headquarters okay. of Fairfield. Now, uh, one of the things that I think pops into my head immediately, once I'm saying crown mortgages, it, it's not like what most people would think when they're thinking, you know, uh, Capital. I got my lend, uh, my loan from uh, or my pre-approval from Capital One, Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo. You know, insert any commercial bank name there. Uh, give me a little bit of reason why someone would, someone should be a little more inclined to work with. You know, let's say, what would you call your? What's the official title of the, the business? Right? Is it direct lender? Yeah. So we're we're bankers, 
right? So th those big banks that you're talking about, the Wells Fargo's, the Chase, the PNC's, um, so those are depositories. And like in the name, like you go and you could deposit your money, you know, so that that's what separates them. Like we don't, you know, you don't come to us to open a savings or checking account. Like we primarily just do loan origination, okay? That's, that's our business. Um, obviously, Wells Fargo and Chase, they provide that service as well. But here's the key difference. And this is why I always tell people, you're always going to get better service working with a banker or, or a mortgage broker than one of these big institutions. Um, it's just because, one, most of the loan officers and those depositories don't really have to be licensed. They're just automatically loan officers or licensed because they are depositories. So they really don't have to do the schooling. So number one, when you go into a branch and you sit down, you know, fancy little office and the guy in front of you, Chances are, I hate to say this, but he probably doesn't know what he's doing, right? He didn't go to, he, he's not there talking to clients, going there. He just waits for walk-ins, all right? So he's not really working your file. He's just there to take applications. He scans them and he sends them off to another office somewhere in the country that actually does um, the pre-approval, so to speak, right? So they're not trained to actually do pre-approval. So that's number one. So when you work with someone like me, who works for, you know, a banker, I actually do your file. I check your income, I check your credit, I make sure that it fits within guidelines, I advise you, and if there's something wrong, I can kind of fix it before we actually go under contract when we actually start the loan process. And that's pretty much, I say, like the biggest strength with, you know, um, well, myself and, and bankers is if you have a good loan office like myself, you know, I really scrub the file before we go on their contract. So if you, you know, if I give a, an agent a pre-approval, it's golden. It, it's it's going to be solid. Very rarely, you know, uh, are there going to be issues. So I really try to scrub my my clients, and that's something you're going to get very little with with uh, the depositories. I think uh, no, I couldn't agree with you more. That and and also because obviously, if if you guys don't know, uh, Gabe is one of my preferred lenders. He's one of the the lenders that I work with on a consistent basis. Obviously, I you know. I, I try to uh, refer as much business as I can because I know that the business and as far as the reputation and the expertise, the level of professionalism is there that I always recommend it to clients, whether or not they decide to go with them. That's a completely different story. Um, but the other thing that I like is the clear line of communication, right? Like I, I, I don't feel like there's several different channels that you have to go through, you know, to talk to, let's say like the underwriter or the loan processor or, you know, the closer, uh, everything is pretty streamlined. And that's one of the things that I really do love about, you know, working with Crown Mortgage that I, I don't think I really got working with other lenders. Yeah. And that's actually one of the reasons why I chose to work with this bank is and this is number. So this is number two, like why I think people should work with me in Crown Mortgage is the process is very smooth. So I, I always tell people it's not just the loan officer. It's also the company behind you. You know, so like I, I, I could. I consider myself, you know, pretty proficient in, in, you know, loan origination. I know my guidelines. I'm, I'm pretty quick to, to analyze file, but I only go so far. If the people in the back end, you know, my process, the underwriters, you know, they're slow, you know, they're, they're, you know, drop the ball. The file is going to be pretty crappy. Right. And that, that's what I tell people is like the strength with Crown Home Mortgage is, and Andre, you could test for this. I mean, we, we've gotten approvals in two, three days, you know, I mean, it's I incredible. I'm not going to lie, man. We, we've gotten approvals before we were even under contract, like in yeah. attorney review process, we've gotten you know, loan, uh, conditional loan commitments. And I'm just like, is this yeah. a joke? <laughs> no, it's crazy. And you know, like I said, it's because one, you know, I really scrub the files. So when I submit something, I'm submitting something that's beautiful. It's very clear. You know, I'm not just like sending like screenshots, I'm, you know, I try to turn into PDS and all these little things make the process so much smoother because when the processor gets it, you know, he just, he, he just fly with it, you know, and he can get that approval and then give it to the underwriter and we get that approval ASAP. Um, and then shout out to my boy, Sean. I know Andres, you know who Sean is. He's our head processor. Man, this guy's working like 24 seven. So once again, guys, it's, you know, it's not just me. We have an awesome team here at Crown Home Mortgage. Our back end systems are like awesome. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to start diving into a little bit of like the qualifications, I'm sure people are watching this and some of them are are kind of curious as far as like, what do I need to purchase a home? I, I, those are the basic standard questions. And they're really like three qualifications, right? If we want to sum them up and, and sort of bullet them, what would you bullet as the three qualifications that you need to, to be able to purchase and elig be eligible to, to apply for a loan? Yeah, it's, it's three things. It's income, credit, assets, done. It, it's, just, it's really that simple. It's not more complicated than that. 
Um, the only time it gets complicated, and, and this is why I tell people, is if you're self-employed or you're a business owner or you have multiple rental properties, it gets a little complicated because there's just way more paperwork. It's not just the W-2 or pay stubs, right? So when you do work for a company, you get paid a salary or you get paid hourly, it's pretty easy to calculate income. We just, you know, look at, you know, what your salary is or we see what you make in one month in pay stubs and that will be your, your qualifying income. Um, and then credit is pretty self-explanatory. You know, for FHA, we look for a minimum like 620, 640 credit score. Uh, conventional, you know, 680. I really don't want to say anything too less than that. Otherwise, the rate kind of, you know, gets affected. But I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, and there can be any two crazy things in a credit score. Um, and obviously, you know, you could be making a million dollars a year, but if you're spending, you know, 950000 on credit stuff, you know, then you only have $50,000 to qualify for a mortgage. That's also the other thing, too. You have a lot of monthly debt that is going to lower your buying power. And obviously, you need money for a down payment and closing costs. That's where the assets come in. So that's it. Yeah, I, I, that, that's perfect, Samson. I think that that's something that a lot of people don't realize, especially, you know, um, when you have uh, individuals who make a tremendous amount of money, but let's say they have a car loan or they have student loan debt or they have, you know, reoccurring or revolving credit debt that does not go away. Um, that, that That's something that they, they realize, you know, I got the income, but, you know, you realize you count for expenses and you're like, yeah, it, it's a little harder to purchase or your buying power has significantly been reduced. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and even uh, to, to go off more on that, I mean, I've seen, seen, I've seen tax returns where, you know, where someone's making like a million dollars in a business and then you know, somehow they're, they're making a loss and, you know, Hey, it is what it is. <laughs> but it, you know, then, then it's the awkward conversation where they're saying, well, I'm making, you know, I'm grossing a million dollars. I'm like, I, I understand that. But I mean, you know, you have a lot of deductions here and it's not a million dollars in here, you know? So it's, it's those kind of conversation. I mean, that's, that's an extreme, but you know, people have to understand, I mean, the more deductions that you, you take in your income, um, on your tax returns, it's going to lower your, your buying power. So you have to, sometimes I tell people, you know, buying a house is kind of preparing, you know, if you think you're going to be buying a house in a year or two, you definitely should talk to a loan officer right away, just so we can kind of tell you, Hey, maybe you want to put more income, less expenses this year. And, you know, obviously you talk to your, your, you know, a CPA or accountant about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now um, I, I think the other question that gets asked a lot is like down payments, right? Like yeah. what, what is the minimum down payment that you need? I, I, you know, everyone is a myth, right? The 20% is, is that some, the minimum down payment that you need to purchase a house. Now, obviously we both know that to not be the case, but uh, can you give us those numbers? Sure. Sure. So, so when it comes to a single family house, we'll start with that. Um, you could go conventional and put 3% down, which, and, you know, I guess I'll talk, touch base what conventional is. So just how the name states conventional, it's a regular, you know, it's a conventional loan, it's a regular loan, you know, that's your typical 20% down, but there is the possibility to put 3% down, okay? Uh, but that's only on a one family. Once you get to a two family, that jumps up to a 15%. And then when you go to a three and four family, you, you go up to a 20, 25% down for a three or four family. Right. This is and still that's conventional only, though, right? That's still conventional, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so pretty much if you have, you know, a credit score about 680, you know, good income, you know, I always tell people you're going to go conventional for a single family house. Okay. Now let's go to FHA. And I'm only going to touch on these two loan products because they're the, you know, they're the most common. There's other ones, but, you know, I think that's beyond the scope of this, this, this mm -hmm. video here. Uh, so for FHA, I mean, that is, uh, you know, government sponsored loan. And what's great about FHA is when it comes to multifamilies, it's three and a half percent down across the board. And that's why, you know, FHA is very, very popular with multifamilies because you get that, you know, low down payment possibility that convention doesn't give you for, you know, anything above a one family. So that, that's pretty much what, what um, you know, what down payments are for the two loan products. Yeah. And so now I, I got a, another question regarding down payments, because I, I, I don't know if you get this. I get this asked a lot. Um, they're always just like, you know, I have somewhere between, let's say, three, three and a half percent, five percent. Should I put five percent down versus three and a half percent or even, you know, let's say about seven percent. They want to put a little bit more money down. What do you usually write? Because I have something that I usually tell people, but let, let me hear what you sure. usually tell. People. I mean, I always tell people, I mean, Put the lowest you can. I mean, unless you're really gonna, unless you really have the money to put 15 to 20 percent down, you know, the difference between putting three percent and five percent down, you know, some people think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm putting five percent down, so my mortgage payment, 
is is lower. Yeah, but that two extra percent, you know, you're not really putting much of a thing on that monthly payment. I mean, I always tell people, I mean, you know, you putting that extra two percent down, maybe saving you 50 to 100 bucks a month. But I mean, wouldn't you rather have that extra 10, 15 thousand dollars in your pocket now? So there, you know, there's that that question, unless you're really putting the 20 percent down because the 20 percent, um, you know, you're, you're, you're limiting mortgage insurance. We could touch on that in a little bit. Um, and that really takes down the mortgage payment. But if, if you're, you know, you're doing anything less than 10, I mean, just, just go the minimum, in my opinion. Yeah. No, every, I, company, every situation is different. I, I usually say that too, especially if they're first time home buyers, uh, simply because, I mean, for the most part, right, New Jersey is an old state. Uh, you're buying an old house, you know, circa early 1900s to, you know, mid 1900s. And odds are something's probably going to break, even if you get an inspected. Um, you know, you, you can, there, there is such a thing as bad luck, you know, and then, um, something could break down and you want to have that money. I think it's always better, especially if, if it's only going to save you, let's say $25 a month, but you know, you can maybe make an extra payment on the principal, right? If you want to, you know, reduce the length of the loan or, or reduce the principal amount. I mean, you can do stuff like that, but I always think it's probably better to kind of keep as much money as you can and, and, you know, have a little bit of like that comfort money in the event that there's an emergency. A hundred percent. I mean, the way I look at it too is, I mean, you want to leverage the bank's money as much as much as you want. I mean, that that's also the way I look at it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, what would you say? Because I, I think the three and a half percent is probably one of the benefits of being a first time home buyer. Uh, what are the other benefits that um, you know aren't really maybe discussed as often or maybe overlooked a little bit, right? So, first home, like for FHA program. Yeah, because I think the biggest thing from what I can, um, you know, from what I can recall is being FHA, one of the biggest things is credit scores, right? That That's one of the yes. bigger things and, and rates too, right? But there, I think there's like maybe a few more. Yeah, so those are the big ones, right? So we got the low down payment. Uh, your credit doesn't have to be perfect. You know, we don't need 700 or 680. You know, like I said, we could go down as low as 620, 640. Uh, you could go lower than that, but then, you know, you have to put more down and stuff. So, I mean, that's once again, a case by case situation. Um, and I mean, really the, the other benefit with FHA. Um, also like I, I, I've noticed too, like, I mean, obviously it's obviously in this market, it's probably not as common, but with the concessions, right? Like being able to finance yes. that. Cause right, 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 right. what's the, per, what's the percentage again of the purchase price um, that you can the, finance for concessions? Yes, for FHA, it's up to at least six percent. Six percent, yeah, I, th I think that's that's right. Yeah, so you can you can finance, or I mean, that would be like, what, like adding, costs. It, yeah, adding your closing costs on it. Mm -hmm. So that that's another really uh, awesome benefit. So you know, you get your you get the ability, like if you don't have, let's say, a perfect, or you know, you have some blemishes on your credit score and it's a little bit lower, or the rates can be a lot more favorable as an FHA buyer versus conventional, right? They're a little more, generally, they're a little more competitive. I know, I think, what was it last year during COVID? Actually, FHA rates were a little bit higher than conventional. Oh, yeah, that was, was a weird, rate. that was a weird time in history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But generally. I mean, yes, that, that, that's what I was trying to think in my head. Um, so the biggest thing, especially for multifamily rates, so conventional rates, this is the biggest thing. So if you go conventional, you know, um, there's adjustments when you stray from the perfect scenario, right? So if you, the perfect scenario is you're putting 20% down, you're buying a single family house, you have great credit. Once you start straying away from those, like those three things, the rate starts to get adjusted and conventional is very sensitive to these, to these adjustments. So, you know, the rate for a uh, four family is definitely gonna be higher than a rate for a single family, right? So that's the beauty thing about FHA as well is that these adjustments don't really, you know, um, don't change don't aren't affected as much with these changes so really the rate for a four family is going to be too much different than a rate from a single family and that's a beautiful thing because you know you're once again you're leveraging the, the bank's money and you know you get a great interest rate so that's really the powerful thing about fha now i i, I want to touch on that because you you brought up the word rates and uh, after this last topic guys i'm going to cut the video short here i mean obviously me and gabe we're going to continue the interview so if you guys want you can go ahead and, and click on my uh the link on my page on my instagram as well as on facebook uh to the youtube channel so you guys can watch the complete full interview uh, but i want to touch on one last subject before i end this little short segment here which is interest rates um 
is there such a thing as like the rates being different at different banks? I feel like that's something that um, maybe isn't discussed as much or, or there is not as much information out there. Do like, for instance, if I go to bank A and then I go to bank B and I get an interest rate, like what, what factors influence interest rates? Right, great question. So the biggest thing is, you know, all companies like, I guess, overhead and their p &L. So typically every bank should really have the same rates, you know? The only reason like it should deteriorate a little bit is that, like some banks have higher overhead, um, you know, just more P and, you know, more, you know, more expenses. So they have to put that into the rate, but it really shouldn't be astronomically more, you know? And I always tell people, I mean, you know, yes, you should always shop around for, for, you know, the best rate possible, but at the same time, you don't want to like sacrifice, you know, a good, a great rate for service. You know, if someone's, you know, a for a quarter higher in a rate, you know, starts asking other questions about like, hey, what are your turnaround times? You know, like, tell me more about your processing, you know, because in a day, like, you know, you want to go with a bank that one is going to close a deal, right? So you could go to bank, bank A, and they can give you the best rate in the world, you know, but their service sucks, you know, and then you actually risk the file not closing, you know, so I, I really think that people should not just focus on the rate, but on the service as well. And once again, that's all determined based on the company's, you know, p &L. So it kind of makes sense. A bank that's maybe a little bit more uh, efficient in the process, you know, maybe they have higher salaries to have better loan officers, or sorry, not loan officers, we're, we're based on commission. I meant processors and underwriters. So they might have just a tiny bit, you know, more rate, but it's going to close. It's going to be less headache. So at the end of the day, you're going to be winning. Yeah, no, I, I, and I think that that's something really important that people need to, because the, the thing is people, I mean, anyone, especially if you're a first time home buyer, you don't know what the right questions are because you've never been in this situation before. Sure. So yeah. these are, these are questions that you obviously have to keep in mind. Like now you start to formulate the questions that you need to ask as you're about to interview the lender that you're going to, you know, ultimately work with to help you close the loan. Um, but anyways, look, guys, we're going to cut the interview short here. I am going to continue on with Gabe real quick. I got a few more questions I want to ask him. And, um, you know, if you guys want to see the full interview, obviously check it out on the YouTube channel. But uh, all right, Gabe, we're going to keep going here. All right. I, I got just a few more things to ask you here. All right. So we said buying a single versus buying a multi. Now, I'm not going to talk about the trade-offs because obviously, you know, that that's something that I think maybe people can surmise, right? Like they, they got a general understanding. There's a little more risk buying a multi versus buying a single, but it's a lot uh, less expensive net, right? After you you consider what you're making in your rent. Um, but I, I think one of the things that people don't think about, especially if they're considering buying a multi, is the fact that, and this is one of the things I kind of struggled with too, is you can you can go from a two family to a one family putting FHA, FHA being the first time home buyer loan on a two family, let's say refinancing, right? When and for those of you that don't know, refinancing kind of like changing the terms of your loan mm -hmm. to a conventional. And then trying to buy the next property FHA as uh, one family is that right? That's okay. That's usually yeah. easy. Yeah. So, you, so the the rule, not the rule of thumb, but the rule is, you can only have one FHA loan at a time, right? So it, it's a one time use. There are some exceptions, such as you know you're relocating, you know more than I believe a hundred miles away, um, you know special circumstances where like you know you, you had a huge you know, increasing your family size, so you need a bigger house. So there's kind of these little things, but arguments say you, you're only supposed to have one FHA loan, period. So yeah, the, the, the work around is that, you know, you buy your first house, let's say it's a multifamily, you bought an FHA, you were trying to get a single, or you're trying to get maybe even get another multifamily, you could refinance out of your FHA into a conventional. And usually, like, you know, if it's some time, probably your, you know, your equity increased. So, you know, you have some more wiggle room. So maybe you could drop your PMI or lower your PMI. So there's a lot of advantages to that. I think that's one of the smartest things you can do. But now you, you can't do it going from a one family to a two family and do, using that same advantage, right? It's, it's really a case by case um, okay. scenario, right? So, I mean, we're just, let's just be blunt. I mean, so the whole point of FHA is that you're supposed to live there, right? And, you know, it is for owner occupied. So I guess the thing is, is the question is like, why are you moving from a single to a multi, right? You know, but, you know, there, there's, there, there's a lot of sensible answers and reasons somebody might do that. They're moving to 
uh, an area that's, you know, closer to their job or that's more desirable to them. Um, maybe the single family house was actually, you know, a little bit smaller than the two families, a little bit bigger, you know, because there are huge two families out there. So, I mean, you know, you, you could do it. It's just, there needs to be a valid reason for it. Okay. And then although that, that reasoning, I, I guess would, you would submit, I get with the underwriter or, you know, as you're preparing the file, cause that's the thing, right? Like as you, when you prepare a file and you submit it to underwriting, they have, you generally have like a checklist. And then if there's something like, let's say in a scenario like this, where it's a little bit more unique, you need to, I guess, submit a letter to, to kind of explaining the, the yeah. reasoning why, right? I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just, just, just flat out. I mean, the reason is, is uh, we want to make sure it's not fraud. You know, we want to mm -hmm. make sure that it, it is legitimate and, you know, it, it raises a question. It's like, huh, why? I always tell people mortgages make sense. It needs to make sense, right? Like we're lending tons of money out to you. So we want to make sure there's nothing uh, funky going on. It's legit. So we, we need to just make sure that uh, it, it, you know, what is the reason? So you, I have had, you know, files in the past where underwriters question, Hey, Mr. Barr, Mr. And Mrs. Barr, why are you moving from your single family house and going to a two family? And they want it in writing, you know, so they could just document the file. So I always tell people, you know, just just be prepared to, you know, you know, put that reason in writing if, if questions. So. All right. Now, uh, one of the last topics that I want to touch on is the uh, closing costs. Right. So closing costs is, is something that I know you can't talk on too much because you're not the bulk of all the. In fact, I would probably say you know, you guys have a very yeah. little small <laughs> section, <laughs> yeah. maybe credit report and everything like that. But it is something that you, you sort of have to uh, calculate. And it's an estimation and an approximation. You guys don't give an exact number. But on average, right. what should someone expect aside from the three and a half percent? What should they expect to be paying in closing costs? 100 percent. So um, like you said, like every bank has kind of their own, you know, origination fee, bank fee, commitment fee, application fee, whatever you want to call it. Um, that that's usually like a very small part of your closing cost. And that, and like I said, that usually pays for the underwriters, the processors, the closers, the openers, everyone that works in the file. Everything else is gonna be the same across the board, no matter what bank you go to. And, you know, I'll quickly break down them. You know, you have your appraisal, credit report, title, huge part of it, you know, um, uh, fees to the city or the municipality. And then you have your escrows and prepaid, which I'm not gonna get into right now, but that's the prepaid and escrows are the majority if, you know, almost half or more of your closing costs. Um, so closing costs is definitely a function of your taxes, mostly because the more taxes, the higher the taxes, um, the more, the higher the escrows and prepaids are because you have to put in escrow and sometimes in prepaids a couple months of taxes. So a property with $15,000 taxes, is gonna have higher closing costs than a house that has $8,000 $8, in taxes, right? And it, like I said, because closing costs, the prepaid and escrows are a function of the taxes. Uh, so, but in New Jersey, I mean, I usually see as in the low end around like eight thousand dollars for closing costs, and then the high end that I've seen personally, you know, is about like fourteen thousand. So I usually tell people between ten and twelve. You know, obviously the taxes are you know eighteen thousand or above, then the, you know these numbers are gonna go much higher. But like I said, I usually tell people between like you know ten and fourteen. No, I mean, it, it, that's always something that people need to keep in mind, because obviously, uh, you know, you, you hear three and a half percent, five percent, you're like, oh, okay, I have that. And then, you know, in this market, unfortunately, um, you know, as, as easy as it was to do before, maybe a couple of years back where you could you could just add or, or request a seller's concession and just finance your closing costs, and it would be a little easier. But nowadays, that's not really a conversation that, uh, you know, sellers are willing to entertain. So, uh, yeah, you, you want to, on average, I would say, have some extra money aside, right? Like maybe ten to $12,000 if you can't squeeze out some extra equity from the home. So it, it, it's certainly something to keep in mind. Right. But I mean, going back to refinancing, the, the great part of refinancing is you, you roll that in to the, to the loan amount. Usually you could pay out of pocket, but I mean, I, I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> just, just roll it in. Oh, so, so for refinancing, you can do it too. Yeah, you go roll it in 100%. Oh, and that's, that's what most cool. That's what most people do. It's it's great. Oh my god! Well, listen. So we actually, I, I think that would be another really awesome topic to maybe get on uh, for next time. Is uh, you know doing a refinancing or you know doing a, what are they HELOCs, right? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Actually, yeah. So we um, can we can talk about that a, a little bit more next time because I, I know that you don't just originate loans or start loan applications and process them for people purchasing houses, but people who already own homes. 
helping them to restructure their their home loan, getting them, uh, you know, uh, having them pull out equity from their house, uh, all, all these different things that you guys can do, especially if you're looking to, you know, maybe do renovations or any, anything. I mean, it can get it can get a little crazy with it. Oh, it's yeah. I mean, refinancing is great. I mean, because it's just numbers at that point. If you're gonna lower your monthly payment or you're putting on equity, I mean, if the numbers make sense. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it, it is literally one of the biggest benefits to owning a house. You know, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, so Gabe, listen, thank you so much, uh, you know, for joining me here. I, I'm going to just keep, I'm going to let you know right now, I'm going to keep recording it just as, you know, kind of we, as we start wrapping up, uh, listen, nowadays you get canceled so quickly. So <laughs> I just want to make sure, you know, neither of us slip up and say something we're like, you know, but um, dude, that, that interview was good, man. It was, it was really good. good I just, good. I, I just, uh, I can't, I don't know if, did the calls interrupt by any chance or no? No, nah, I think oh, came from my end. Okay, perfect. You didn't hear. It. All right, good. Because yeah, I kept it good. I, I like I I forget to put my uh, laptop and my phone on Do Not Disturb. And I'm just... oh, I didn't I didn't hear anything actually. No. Okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. Know, actually... One second, or it, it went cut off, but that was it. That was nothing. I got I got a, I got a question for you though. Like if if you could go back in time, right? Let's say you're just about to start. What Rutgers, right? You're a Scarlet Knight. Is that what yeah. you guys are? Hundred percent. Okay. Are you big? I'm, I'm a high, Highlander. I don't know what the hell that is, but um, all right. So if you could go back in time, you're a freshman, you're about to start your first class. You're sitting in class, right? I don't know. What was your first class? Do you remember? My first class ever? Yeah. Like the first college it was, class. It was probably calculus one. Okay. You're sitting there and then you could, someone came up to you. You're like, yo, what are you doing? Get out of here. Go start real estate. Would you, would you stop and never get your degree and go into real estate earlier? It's a great question. So I, I get this. I get this question a lot, actually, and I want to say yes and no. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go into that. I, I need a yes. So, I need a yes yeah. or a no. Don't give me a yes. I know. Or I know. No. All right. So I'm gonna say no, and okay. this is the reason why. Because any business is really hard. Any business is super super hard, you know. And you could attest to that. I don't care what you do. It could be real estate, mortgages, you know. Uh, an e-commerce business, you know, you have coffee shop, business is hard. And I think every entrepreneur knows the feeling of, you know, struggling and wanting to quit and thinking like uncertainty, like this is for me and why not. And, you know, I always tell people like, you know, success wasn't an accident for me. Like I worked my ass off to get where I was. And, you know, there was times I felt like I was quitting. And the only, most part of the reason why I didn't quit is because I had something to compare it to, right? Like I did the whole four-year college thing. I did engineering. I hated it, you know? So what kind of fueled me, fueled me into like pursuing real estate and keep going when it got hard and tough and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it or not was I kept thinking, damn, I do not want to go back to my regular job. I do not want to go back to that life. So that's why I say, no, I would, I would see, I would see it through because I know I need to be, I need to go through that experience of going through college, getting the job, hating it to really like have the grit stick with being an entrepreneur and, and sticking with real estate. So that's my answer. Well, and you know, it's funny. I'm, and mine is kind of like a, a variation of that, but I, I guess with me was, um, you know, when I was in school, I, I, did, did you work while you were in school or no? No. Nah. Okay. So like I was, I was working, I was going to, I was working, I was working as a, a cashier at a muscle maker grill one of the biggest reasons why i shout him out all the time so if you guys are watching muscle maker grill in clifton best spot to go to talk Very to good. tom but um anyways i was working there i was doing real estate a little bit like part-time as i was getting in there and i was going to school and then as i started to transition into being a little bit more full-time a lot more active generating more business i was just like uh you know damn like i i don't know i i'm seeing the amount of money i'm making in real estate and still going to school and i'm like if i did this full-time like you know i would I think I could do a lot better. And so, you know, I stopped to, to realize, I'm just like, dude, it, it's crazy how at the entry level, I'm, I'm, I'm a graduated biomedical engineering degree as a bachelor's entry level, it's, you know, less than $60,000 a year. And it's not to, you know, cast shame or anything like that. Like it, it's, that's a good income. You know, it's a, it's a, I think, I don't know what the median income is for the, the US, but it's probably somewhere in that ballpark range, let's say 50, 60,000. Um, I don't even think it is to be honest, but oh, maybe even 40. I mean, yeah. but, but I was just like, I was just like surprised, you know, I'm, I'm like, do I really want to, you know, I studied so hard for this. Do I really want to 
go into the field, entry level position, start competing with people. Like now I have to show my worth to, you know, get paid 40, 50, $60,000. I, I just, I didn't see the benefit in that. So that's what I was just like, all right, let me try doing real estate full time. You know, I'm, I am passionate about it. I, I love it. It's fun. It's exciting. I like helping people. And I mean, that's why I haven't really turned back and, and maybe one way, one day I'll find a way to kind of tie the two together. But at the moment, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. And I, I mean, you, you started as an agent, it opens up the doors for like other different, it's like you, you get into real estate, you become an agent or you do something in real estate. And then it opens up the door for like a whole 100%. bunch of other things. hundred percent. So, and I, I, I only ask you that question because I remember when I was, uh, you know, when we were back with Realty Empire, right. You would be like, you know, quit school. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, what are you doing? Like, quit school. I was just like, no, man. Like, I, I'm already like halfway through. You know? I know. Like, I used to joke around with you like that. I mean, I was half serious. I was like, dude, what are you doing? Just yeah. leave. I was like, yeah, you got your degree, man. That's why you, you're, it's easy for you to say it. But uh, I know, I know, I know. That's funny. Uh, well, hey, at least, you know, you finished. We both finished. Yeah, it's, well, a nice I mean, piece of, it's a nice piece of paper on my wall now. Yeah, I mean, mine's not even hanging <laughs> up, but somewhere, somewhere around here. Um, but I, I wanted to ask, I guess, one last question before we, before we wrap up. What do, you, what do you think you see yourself doing? At least, like, do you think you see yourself doing this long term? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I so the reason also why I like mortgages too is because uh, I like how I could really just work anywhere. So I am going to Columbia this Sunday, and I will be working. So you know, I'm being a beautiful tropical city <laughs> and i'll be making money because i'll still be working on my loans i mean we're closing the uh it was closing steven on on friday so i mean i'm gonna be doing that you know while i'm in, you know at the pool with the beautiful sun and all the beautiful trees around me so and beautiful yeah, good, women good. too so <laughs> that was, i wanted to keep it pg but yes that's it i mean it said beautiful we didn't go you know into any detail <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I get you. And that's the other thing I like to listen, to be honest, like, yeah, do we work hard? Like as, especially like we're all independent contractors, right? Like you, you're a commission-based job and you still do real estate too. Like you're an agent and you also do loans too. So you're active in both. I, I'm obviously just real estate agent right now. Um, but what I love is that like, it, I don't know about you. It just doesn't feel like obviously you, you have, you know, stress and responsibility and this and that, you know, making appointments to sh show houses or whatever, open houses, whatever, but it just, it doesn't still, it still doesn't feel like a job to me. You know, like it doesn't like I, I, I and I, that's one of the things I love about it. Like, I don't have someone on my, like I, I am on my own ass kind of like do this, do that, do this, but it's not like someone nagging at you kind of like, Hey, go to work do this, do that. Like, you know, that you have to sort of do it. hundred percent. I mean, that, that's what I tell people. I, I'm a huge proponent of entrepreneurship and, you know, self-employment and, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm, I was probably the worst employee. I, I'm just going to be honest. And <laughs> it, this is going to sound bad, but, uh, you know, this is another thing really like why I think I was meant to, you know, be an entrepreneur and be self-employed is because, you know, when I was working for a job and I was getting paid a salary, you know, you're not going to make more money by working harder. So I, I hate to say it, but I definitely not put full effort at my job. You know, I'm not going to stay longer. I'm getting paid the damn same amount if I work freaking eight hours to 10 hours a day. So I'm going to leave at eight hours, you know? And, but you know, when, when you're an entrepreneur or when you're self-employed, I love it. The more effort you put, more time you put into it, the more money you're going to make. So literally if you want to make more money. You just got to work harder and smarter. And, and, and that's the beauty of our profession. And you're, you're absolutely right. The one thing I'm thinking about, and it's so funny because I mean, it's not funny. It's just like, like when you, when you move into a different field, no, I, I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate on what I was going to say. I just want to choose my words a little carefully because I don't want people to think I'm being uh, insensitive, but like, I, I, I don't know what the, I think the minimum, I thought the minimum wage was like about maybe 11 or $12. I, I don't know what it actually is, but like the reason why I say that is because I remember I, for those of you guys watching, listen, my first job, I started as a cashier at Burger King. Like I was 16 years old working drive through you too. AMC, baby. AMC theaters. Uh, listen, AMC was paying good, man. I was oh, getting paid like 725 and you get to watch movies. And so, no, oh, yeah. that's now I was getting paid 825. I think at the time, man, I was uh, getting paid 725 when I started. Yeah. And so. then, uh, yeah, free movie. That was dope. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I mean, what I, I got like free fries and chicken tenders, you know, <laughs> but but going back to that, like I remember, you know, working and it just it 
you know, you either you work time and like you worked over the 40 hours or you worked on a holiday, you know, a couple hours. And then you, you would be like, oh, like you, you calculate, you're like, oh, time and a half or, you know, I'm getting paid extra, this and that. And then you look at your check and then all the money's coming out from tax and you're like, what the hell? Like, I, I just, so I just gave up my Christmas and then I'm going to say like 50% of it just went to, to back to taxes. So I, I really, I busted my ass for nothing. And, and in, in this business, and obviously just being just an entrepreneur, it doesn't have to be real estate. It could be, you know, opening up your own business, a, a bakery, whatever, like you can put more hours into it and you will see the rewards from working. Right. And it's, again, it's not to, to cast any, any, any shame on people who work um, and, and work as a, a W2 employee or anything like that. Like, you know, there are some jobs that have incredible benefits. That's one of the things I am a little bit uh, upset about is lack of health insurance. It's on my leg, baby. Yeah. It's so expensive. So I, I've, I've said already, I tell people like, listen, if I get married, I don't want to, I don't want to hear none of this entrepreneur stuff. I want, I want to hear you got a nice corporate job <laughs> <laughs> with good benefits. I don't want to hear about. You're you married for stuff. benefits, bro. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that's your, your first date. That's your question. So what, how are your benefits what's the, what's, the, <laughs> what's, your, what's the health, what's the name of your health insurance company? <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, look, it has its trade-offs. I'm not going to lie. There, there's good, there's a good, bad, and then there's a, you know, a neutral field, but, you know, Gabe, listen, man, this, this, this conversation was awesome. You know, I, uh, I think we should do it again and talk about like a little bit more like the refining, refinancing side of it, because I think, um, you know, that, that would be another really awesome topic to, to discuss. And, uh, you know, let, it, let's just keep in touch and see when, when we can, when we can do another one. You got it. By the way, I love the shirt, man. I feel like we were just. And it's like we, it, it, I can't believe we didn't even plan this, guys, by the we way. Didn't plan we didn't plan it. Plan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, Gabe, listen, thank you so much. And, and by the way, guys, those of you guys watching, I mean, I live this. Gabe did my loan. Incredible job. Incredible job. It, it took a little while, but it wasn't his fault. I'm, I'm going to be honest. It was not his fault. Hey, things Ando. happen. I'm suspecting. So we got it closed, man. That was, that was impressive. Don't buy a condo. If I could give you an advice, don't, don't buy a condo. <laughs> buy condos, guy. Buy condos. <laughs> All right, All right man. man. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you so much Got for being on. See you. Bye-bye.